Namaste. Today we begin a new module which is distribution and abundance. So, this module will have three lectures. The first one is biogeography, which is the analysis of geographic distributions. So, biogeography is the field of ecology that asks the questions why are things where they are? And we will look at this topic in more detail in the second lecture, which is why, why are things where they are. So, here we will ask if there is a species that is found in a certain area. So, why is that species only found in that area? What is constraining the range of that species? Why is it not found anywhere else? And the answer to that is some push factors and some pull factors. So, push factors are those factors that are pushing that species away from other areas and pull factors are those factors that are attracting the species to that particular area. So, every species tries to remain in an area or can or best is best able to survive in those areas that are that have the most suitable climatic conditions, most suitable biotic conditions for the survival of that particular species. So, which is why we get a certain geographic distribution for every species and this is what is asked in the topic of biogeography. So, let us begin. Biogeography is the study of the geographical distribution of life on earth and the reasons for the patterns one observes on different continents, islands and oceans. So, essentially it is asking why are certain species found in certain areas and it also asks it tries to document which species are found in which areas. So, it is the study of the geographical distribution of life on earth. So, that is a cataloging of, uh, of different species in different areas and the reasons. So, not only do you catalog, but you also ask why what is the reason behind such a particular geographical distribution. So, and the reasons for the patterns one observes on different continents, islands and oceans. Now, depending on which particular areas you are concentrating on, there are further subdivisions of biogeography such as island biogeography that asks the question, uh, how do species come into an island, how many species will there be in any particular island, what would that depend on, does it depend on the structural uh, diversity of the habitats that is there in on the island, does it also depend on the size of the island and so on. Similarly, you can have oceanic biogeography which will ask the question how, what are the species in the oceans that are found near the continents, what are the species that are found away from the continents, what are the species that are found in the upper layers of water, what are the species that are found in the seabed, what are the species that are found in the column of water and so on. So, you can have different sub disciplines of biogeography in the term in the form of continental biogeography, island biogeography, oceanic biogeography and so on. Now, when we are asking which species is found in which area, the other scientific term, term that comes into picture is the range. The range is the distribution of the species. So, the range or distribution of a species is the geographical area within which that particular species can be found. Now, when we are asking this question which species is found in which areas and how are the, these different areas different from each other, it makes sense to have an understanding of different kinds of habitats that exist on this planet or at least the kinds of habitats that we have in India because India itself is a very uh, a varied country by geographically and so we have different kinds of habitats. We have very uh, high mountains, we have deserts, we have the oceans we have different kinds of forests, we have grasslands and so on. So, now we will have a look at some major Indian habitats and their residents. <coughs> Let us begin with the alpine meadows. Now, alpine is a term that refers to the mountains. So, this is a meadow, a meadow is a grassland. So, this is a grassland that is found in the mountains and a good example is the Dachigam National Park which is there in Srinagar. Now, in the case of Dachigam National Park, here you can observe that you have this these hills and these hills have these meadows or the grasslands. Now, a place like Srinagar is having an extremely cold climate and that is the climate that is there in Dachigam as well. So, climatically we can say that these areas that have the alpine meadows, they have a cool or a cold climate. Typically, they are at a great height because you have mountains or you have hills here. 
typically if you talk about the wind speeds, the wind speeds will be very high because this is a mountainous area. In a mountainous area you have winds in the daytime, you also have winds in the night time. Now, if you look at a hill, so let us consider a hill and if you have the sun here. Now, in the daytime what happens is this particular area it preferentially gets heated because of the sun's rays. So, this area becomes warmer. Now, when this area becomes warmer the air around it also becomes warmer and it starts rising. Now, when it starts rising the cold air that is there in the valley. So, here you have the valley and the cold air that is there in the valley it will start rising upwards to fill up the gap. So, this is the kind of wind pattern that we will observe in the daytime and this is this is known as a valley breeze. Now, in the night time, so in the night time when you have the when you do not have the sun. So, now what happens is the valley area because it is sort of secluded from both the sides. So, here the air remains as such whereas, the hill areas or the top areas they are able to lose out the radiation very fast. So, they are able to lose out the heat. Now, when that happens the air here becomes cooler. So, here you have a cooler air and the cooler air is more denser and so this air now starts flowing towards the valley. Now, this wind is known as a hill wind. Now, in the case of these alpine meadows not only do they have a cold climate, but at the same time they also have a very high wind speed. Now, at the same time we can talk about the soil characteristics that we have in the, these areas. Now, typically the soil here will not be very fertile. Why? Because they have been, um, been uh, in, in this particular state for say thousands of years and whenever there is a rainfall. So, all the minerals that are there on the top layer of the soil they will start uh, dissolving in the rain water and they will start moving down slope. So, they will reach into the streams and then they will reach into the rivers and ultimately they will get drained into the seas. So, these areas are typically not very fertile. At the same time especially in the case of uh, this particular area you have the rocks that are making these mountains and there is a continuous process of weathering that is going on. Now, in the process of weathering the rocks are getting broken into smaller fragments and they are ultimately making soil in these areas. Now, that soil with the rains it moves down exposing more rocks which ultimately makes more soil and so on. So, this is a process that goes on. Now, if we are asking the question why are these particular species of grasses found in these areas we ha will have to make a, a correlation between the requirements of the species and the actual climatic conditions that we have in this area. So, it is possible that the grasses that are growing here do not require a very high level of fertility and they are tolerant to high wind speeds and they are also tolerant to low temperatures. So, these are the kinds of correlations that we will make in the case of biogeography. Now, alpine meadows are found in Jammu and Kashmir, it, they, they are also found in Uttarakhand and in a number of areas where you have hills and uh, typically you will find that the species are more or less common between these areas. Now, another kind of habitat that we have is known as an alpine forest. Now, again alpine is a mountainous area. So, alpine forests are those forests that are found in the mountainous areas. Now, typically you will find trees that are coniferous trees and you will also find some broadleaf trees. Now, in the case of these coniferous trees you will have a structure that permits snow to fall down because and they will have a very specific shape of the tree. So, for instance if you have a tree like this and if there is a, a very heavy snowfall so all of this snow comes on these on the canopy of these trees which will make it extremely top heavy and that would facilitate the toppling of this particular tree. So, in the case of these areas typically you will find that the trees have a conical structure. Now, this particular shape facilitates that if you have 
snowfall. So, this snowfall moves down to the ground. So, it is not able to accumulate very much on top of these trees and because of which these trees are able to uh, withstand heavy snowfall as well. Now, in the case of alpine forest, we will find some of these coniferous trees together with some associated species uh, which would even be broad leaved species. Now, when we are talking about these meadows and these forests, there would also be very specific animal species that are found in these areas. So, for instance, in the case of Uttarakhand, you will also find species like the pika. Now, pika is a very small mouse species that is only found in this area. Now, these are the alpine forests and then if you move southwards, we reach the moist deciduous forests. Now, these are again uh, the deciduous forests that are found in Uttarakhand. Now, when we say deciduous, now deciduous forest is a forest type in which the trees have this adaptation that they shed their leaves in a particular season. Now, you could have trees that shed their leaves in the summer season in certain areas. So, when trees are shedding their leaves in the summer season, the main reason is that they want to conserve water because in uh, the summer season is, is typically the pinch period for water and water is lost from the leaves through the process of transpiration. So, if you lose out all your leaves, so it, uh, so the amount of water that you will be losing out every day becomes less. On the other hand, there could be some other species that uh, shed their leaves uh, in the spring season. In those cases, uh, it, um, these trees typically store their waste materials into their leaves and then they shed their leaves, so that the waste materials are gotten rid of. So, these are the kinds of adaptations that we will find in these areas. Now, typically in a moist deciduous forest, you will find a very heavy ground cover. Now, these are the moist deciduous forests of Uttarakhand. If you talk about the climatic conditions, here the climatic conditions will not be that extreme. It is not very cold, but then it is cool. Plus, in these areas, you have ample amount of moisture available throughout the year and the wind speeds are not very high plus the amount of solar uh, insulation that you get in this area is also not very high because typically these areas are uh, on a uh, higher uh, latitudes. So, these would be the characteristics of the uh, terrain of this area or the characteristics of the uh, of this particular region. The soil typically again is not very fertile, but uh, and all of these trees like these are the sal trees that are found in this area and these trees are adapted to these conditions. Now, in the case of biogeography, when we ask the question why are sal trees found in these particular areas, that is because a sal requires these conditions. So, it requires ample amount of moisture, it cannot tolerate a very heavy cold and it does not require a very fertile soil. So, this is why we can say that sal is found in this particular area. Now, in certain other areas, we will find dry deciduous forest. Now, again, this is a deciduous forest because it is shedding its leaves. Now, in the case of a, of a dry deciduous forest, you will have typically less amount of moisture that is available to the plants. And a good example of a dry deciduous forest is a teak forest. So, teak forest is something that you will find extensively in the case of Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Maharashtra, Gujarat. And in the case of teak forest, these forest shed their leaves right before the summer season, so that they are able to conserve moisture and they are found in these areas because they are able to tolerate quite a, uh, uh, quite a heavy amount of drought in these areas. Now, moving westwards in our country, we have the scrub forest. Now, a scrub forest is, uh, you can uh, typically find a scrub forest in Rajasthan or Gujarat. Now, in the case of a scrub forest, you will have such a situation that the land is exposed in a number of areas plus you have these small shrubs in the area. Typically, these shrubs are very thorny shrubs. So, here again you have a, a very low amount of moisture that is available to the plants and the plants also show adaptations to conserve this moisture. So, there would be a number of plants that would have reduced their leaves into the spines or the thorns. Now, when you have a leaf that is converted into a thorn, so it not only gives protection to the plant, but that is also an adaptation through which it is able to reduce the amount of water losses through transpiration. 
Now, in these areas because you do not have very tall trees, these areas have such low amounts of, of moisture that they are not able to support tall trees. So, typically the ground flora is exposed to a very heavy amount of solar radiation. So, the plants would be adapted to that as well. So, the, you would find a number of species where the leaves are covered in a waxy coating not only to reduce the amount of moisture that is being lost, but also to reflect the solar radiation that is incident on these plants. Now, when we talk about the animals of these areas, these areas do not support a very high density of animals typically because the amount of moisture is less and also you do not have ample amount of fodder that is available to the animals and green fodder is only available in certain seasons in plenty. Otherwise, the animals have to uh, make use of this dry fodder or maybe some amounts of leaves that some animals can uh, have access to. If you move further westward in the case of Jodhpur, you will find these sand dunes. Now, we have moved from a scrub forest to a sand dune. Now, a sand dune is typically a very dry area and these trees they have been imported and planted to stabilize the sand dunes otherwise the sand dunes typically do not support a very large number of trees and the sand is very friable it moves from place to place and again here the amount of moisture that is available for the for supporting life is very less and there would be very great amount of adaptations to severely uh, constrain the amount of water that is being lost or to reduce the requirement of water per day. And in this case you will find very specialized species such as this spiny tailed lizard that is only found in this area. Now again if you ask this question why do you have this spiny tailed lizard in this area? The answer would be because this particular species is adapted to, to this area plus the conditions in this area are so harsh that the predators of this particular species are not able to live in this area. Otherwise, if you have a, a very heavy large number of predators in this area, they would eat up the all the spiny tail lizards that are found in this area. So, again you have this species because there are certain pull factors for it for this particular region. So, it is well adapted plus also it has a very less number of predators that are there in this area. And also the other areas have push factors. So, other areas uh, have conditions that this lizard is not comfortable with or the other areas has predators that would eat up this lizard. So, typically we find a distribution of this lizard more in this area. We also find estuaries. Now, estuaries are very specialized habitat where you have a river that is coming and meeting the seas. So, you have a confluence of fresh water and this, the saline water. Now, here again the species that would be found would be those that are tolerant to both these levels of salinity. So, they can tolerate fresh water and, and also they can tolerate the salty water. Plus, there would be a number of species that will make use of all these three kinds of habitats that will be found in, in an estuary. So, when you have an estuary, so you have this river that is coming and it is meeting the ocean. Now, in the case of the ocean you have a very high salinity whereas, in the case of the river you have a very low salinity. Now, typically you will find that these intermediate areas have an intermediate level of salinity. And here you will have a number of species that would spend part of their time in the high salinity areas, part of their time in the intermediate salinity areas and part of their time in the low salinity areas. So, this provides a very specialized habitat and the species that are found in these areas are found here because these are the only few areas where you can have all these three kinds of salinities that are available in the same area. So, this is why you will have these species, these are specialized species that will be found in these areas. Now, near the estuaries of Gujarat, you also have the run of Kutch. Now, run of Kutch uh, is home to the wild asses that are found in our country. So, you have the Indian wild ass sanctuary. 
Now, here again if you talk about the habitat conditions, you will find that it is a very flat land, there are hardly any hills around. So, it is a very flat land and if you go there, you can see kilometers and kilometers of very flat land. Now, in the case of the rainy season, this area gets somewhat inundated and in the case of the dry season, it will just act like a very flat dry piece of land. Now, again the the habitat is so specialized that you have a, a few months of the year that this area is inundated and the other months of the year in which this area is completely dry. So, again the species that will be found in this area will also be extremely specialized and especially in the dry season you do not have access to water in a number of places and so the species will be very constrained in their movement. Now, the wild asses that are found in this area are adapted to these dry conditions, so they do not require a very large amount of water plus they are able to feed on the native vegetation that is found in this area. So, this area cannot support other predators and this area can support the wild asses because of which you have the wild asses that are living in this area. Now, typically the water sources in this area are extremely saline because this area when it gets uh, inundated it also uh, receives some amount of salty water from the seas and also the ground water is extremely salty. So, that also makes this habitat extremely specialized. So, if you take these wild asses out and place them into some other forest say if you keep these in, in the forests of Madhya Pradesh, so the tigers will come and hunt these wild asses. But then because tigers are not able to survive in this area, so the wild asses are, are able to sustain themselves in this particular area. In certain regions of the run of Kutch, you will also find these water bodies that will support a very dense population of flamingos. Now, flamingos again are very specialized birds, so they are a migratory birds, they spend some time in India and sometimes they move out and when they are here in India, you can see that all of these are pinkish in color because of their very specialized diets. Now, in their diets, they have certain, uh, uh, certain plants that are rich in carotenoids and also certain animals that are rich in these carotenoids and these carotenoids these are compounds that are getting uh, accumulated into their bodies. So, if you talk about why this bird is found in this area, you again have to make a correlation between the requirements of the bird. So, this bird requires water, it is feeding in on the organisms that are found in water. So, it will only be found in areas that have water plus this has other requirements. So, typically these flamingos come here and they also breed in these areas. If this bird is coming here to breed, it requires an area that does not have predators, it requires an area where it can have ample source of food which it can feed to its young ones. So, again because this the surrounding area is extremely dry and you do not have a number of predators, so you can have a, uh, a sustained population of these birds in this area. Another very specialized habitat is that of the lagoons. Now, here we are seeing the Chilka lagoon. Now, in the case of a lagoon as well, similar to the case of an estuary, a lagoon is a large water body. So, in the case of your Chilka lagoon, you have this water body, here you have the oceans, in this particular case you have the Bay of Bengal. Now, the lagoon is drained by a number of rivers. Now, these rivers are bringing in fresh water or a low salinity water. Now, in the case of the Bay of Bengal, you have high salinity. So, you have saline water here. Now, these lagoons are separated from the sea with these sandbars. Now, when you have these sandbars, here you have fresh water coming in from this area and you have a saline water that is coming in from this area. 
Now again if you went ahead and tried to measure the amount of salinity that you will have in the lagoon, you will typically find that these areas that are near to the sandbars have a very high level of salinity. These areas that are near the mouths of the rivers have low level of salinity and the other areas have an intermediate level of salinity. Now here again if you ask what are the species that are found in these areas, so there is a dolphin by the name of the Iravadi dolphin that is found in this area and this dolphin makes use of, it makes an extensive use of the uh, organisms that are found in this area. Now typically the plants that would grow here in near the banks which have a very low salinity will be very different from the plants that would be growing in these high salinity areas. So, this makes a habitat that is structurally very diverse plus you will have um, especially in the case of this Chilka lake the depth of the water is very less. So, the depth of the water is typically like 2 or 3 meters. Now, when you have a, a depth of water that is typically 2 or 3 meters, so all of this water is able to receive sunlight from because if you look at a column of water, now if you have incident sunlight, the sunlight will not be able to penetrate completely to the down uh, surface because uh, typically uh, your sunlight is able to penetrate say around 5 or 6 meters of the water column. Now here because the area is extremely shallow, so most of this water column is having the sunlight which makes it extremely rich photosynthetically. So, you have a lot of photosynthetically active radiation that is available in this area which supports a very extensive plant life. Plus at the same time because you have these fresh water rivers and you have agricultural fields in this area, so these uh, rivers are also bringing in a number of nutrients into this area. So, typically the amount of nutrients is very high, the amount of uh, food production because of the autotrophs, the photo autotrophs that are found in this area is very high that also supports a very large uh, population of fishes in this area. Now, if you have a heavy fish, fish population, so there would be a number of predators that can now sustain in this area and examples are the Iravadi dolphins or a number of piscivorous birds that are supported by these kinds of habitats. Now again if you have to ask the question why is Iravadi dolphin found in this area, you will have to make a correlation between the abiotic factors that are found in this area and also the biotic factors that are found in this area. Abiotic factors as in you have a, you have this water that is not of a very great depth, so you have a lot of photosynthesis that is going on in this area. In terms of salinity, you have a distribution of salinity in this area. In terms of uh, nutrition, you have a, a very heavy nutrition load that is coming in from the streams and then all of these abiotic factors are giving rise to biotic factors. So, you have a very heavy amount of photosynthesis that is going on in this area which is leading to a lot of food production. Now, that food production is supporting a number of uh, fish species in this area because they are getting an ample amount of food. Now, if they are getting an ample amount of food, they will uh, have a very large populations which will then sustain other organisms that are dependent on the fishes such as the birds and the dolphins. So, if you did not have the fishes in this area, the dolphins would not have occurred in this area. If you did not have this depth of water, you would not have fishes, you would not have the dolphins. Now, biogeographically, if you ask the question why are dolph dolphins found here? here is the answer. Now moving to the northeast part of the country, here we are seeing the Brahmaputra flood plains. Now Brahmaputra flood plains in the state of Assam are governed by the uh, life of the river. So typically you have this river Brahmaputra which is uh, draining this area, this is Kaziranga National Park and in the rainy season the river floods and when it floods it inundates the whole of this area. So, you have these flood plains that completely get inundated. Now, when these flood plains are getting inundated, the sediments that were there that were brought by the river, they are also distributed to all of these areas. Now, these sediments are extremely new soils, so they are extremely fertile and so the, uh, the grass uh, growth in this area will be very high. 
at the same time when you have this river that floods the area whatever remains in this area gets killed. So, essentially what happens is when you have a flooding so all the existing grasses or other plants that would be found in this area there are a number of mimosa species that are found in this area and all of them get killed in the flood season. Now, typically if you did not have this regular flooding in this area, so you would see that you have grasses, after the grasses it would start getting a series of success successional stages. So, from grasses you would move to shrubs, from shrubs you would move to trees and ultimately this area would become a very dense tree rich forest area. But then because we are having floods every year, so all these species any plant that is coming up in this area. So, suppose this is a sapling of a tree, so this sapling will also get killed in this area. So, so typically the only period that is available for the growth of plants is the period where you are not having the floods and what are the species that can grow very fast in this area that are the grasses species. So, which is why in these flood plains you will see that typically for a very long distance you do not see any trees. Now, if you have an area that has these grass species and here you have ample amount of moisture that is available, the climate is not extreme and in this in these regions you have ample amount of grasses. Now, grasses are again producer organisms and they perform photosynthesis, they bring in a lot of food for a number of animals and so this area supports a very heavy uh, density of the herbivores. Now, if you have a heavy density of herbivores, a large population of herbivores this would also support the carnivores. So, Kaziranga uh, national park is also a tiger reserve, it supports a dense density uh, or a dense population of tigers in this area. Now, this also supports organisms like the rhinoceros. Now, rhinoceros again is an animal that is dependent on these grasses and because we have these grasses here you have these floods every year. So, these floods are not allowing the competitors to remain in this area. So, you have uh, the, the rhinoceros that is found in this area. So, again if you ask why is rhinoceros found in Kaziranga National Park you will have to answer in terms of the pull factors. So, the pull factors are that you have um, ample amount of uh, food that is available to this animal, you have an equitable climate that is available to this animal, you have an adequate amount of protection that is being provided to this animal and in uh, you will also have to talk about the push factors. So, this animal cannot live in say very high hills or it cannot live in the deserts. So, those are the areas where it would not be found plus if there are areas where it has some predators or there are people who are trying to kill this animal. So, it would be wiped off from the other areas and would then only be found in these areas. So, again push and pull factors would tell you what species are found in which area and why. Now, moving southwards here we are observing the Shola forest. Now, you can see a Shola forest in uh, say Karnataka or Tamil Nadu. Now, these again are very specialized habitats. What is happening here is you have certain trees. So, you have this tree and then you have this grass. Now, typically the tree is not able to expand itself. So, let us say that here you have this is a patch of trees and then you have the patch of grasses. Now, in the case of these Shola forests, the trees are not able to expand their territory outside and the grass is also not able to expand its territory inside the patch of the trees. So, in this case there is a dynamic equilibrium. So, you will find trees and you will find grasses and these are found uh, in these areas and if you try to replace one with the other they can be replaced, but then just because of their mutual competition the tree is not allowing grass to come into its area and the grass is not allowing tree to come it to its area. So, this makes it a very structurally diverse habitat. Plus you would observe that again because this is a hilly area, so there are very high wind speeds. With very high wind speeds if you have a tall tree, so let us say that you have a very tall tree in an area with a large sized canopy and if there is a heavy wind in this area, so there would be a lot of pressure that is being provided 
to this tree and either this tree would topple down or this tree would break somewhere. Now, if that be the situation, how should trees respond to a situation of very high wind speeds? Now, this is one adaptation that we will find in the Shula forest. You will find that typically the trees are very stunted, so they do not have a great height. So, you will have these trees, so you will have trees that are extremely stunted plus these trees will remain close to each other. So, in this case if there is a high wind speed that is only uh, applied to this particular tree and the other trees get protected. So, you do not have a, a, a high wind speed that is being suffered from these trees. So, these are again very specialized habitats that you have only in these particular areas and these support a very rich biodiversity that is only found in these areas because these would support those species that require both the trees and the grasses for their survival. Now, moving further south, if you visit the Andamans, here you have the equatorial forests. Now, in the case of equatorial forests, if we talk about the abiotic conditions, uh, these are islands, so the, uh, so the variation in temperatures is not very high, it is warm throughout the year. The rainfall is plenty and when it rains, it rains horribly, it rains cats and dogs. So, there is a, an ample amount of moisture that is available for the growth of vegetation. Typically, the trees that you will find in this area will be very large. So, they will be very tall trees, you can see this log that is being moved by this elephant. Now, elephants are not naturally found in this area, but elephants were brought to this area uh, to help in the logging operations. Now, in the case of equatorial forests, because these are close to the equator, you have a heavy, uh, a large amount of sun, sunlight that is available for the growth of the vegetation. So, you have ample water, you have ample sunshine, you have a fertile soil and so you have very tall trees. Now, typically when you ask about the species that are found in this area, they will have to be adapted to these conditions. So, these are the pull factors, if you are once adapted to certain conditions, you will prefer living in those conditions. And if you go near the coastal areas, you will find the mangroves. Now, mangroves again are very specialized organisms, plus they also provide a very specialized habitat to, us, to a number of other organisms. Now, in the case of mangroves, here you can see that their roots are typically very large in size, these are the stilt roots. You also find a number of pneumatophores, so pneumatophores are those roots that move from the ground upwards to get air. Now, these are found in areas that are typically very marshy, so when you have a high tide, uh, a lot of this area will get inundated, when you have the low tide. So, this area becomes exposed again. So, these are the, the species that can make use of such uh, abiotic conditions of partial inundation or complete inundation at times. These are adapted to, to these conditions and which is why these species can thrive well in this area. Now, suppose you went to this area and you try to plant a teak tree or say a sal tree that we normally find in a deciduous forest. So, these areas will not support a teak or sal tree because of the high salinity that is there in the waters. But then if you move inside the island, you have ample amount of sunlight, ample amount of water and if you are able to remove the other trees, so artificially you can have a very good teak plantation in these areas. Now, once these mangroves are here, now we can also look at a number of community interactions that will happen because these mangroves are found here. Now, these roots of the mangroves, they provide a specialized habitat for a number of other species. So, they can act as breeding grounds for fishes, they can act as nurseries because they are able to protect the young ones of the fishes from their predators. At the same time, these areas also support a large population of uh, saltwater crocodiles. Now, these crocodiles can live, can live in these areas and they can make use of these roots to get their prey or to kill their prey. So, typically what a crocodile does <coughs> is that it would come to these roots. Now, a crocodile is not able to chew its food, so it normally has to tear the flesh that it has caught. So, if there is an animal, so this uh, crocodile has to tear it apart and then it will gulp it. 
Now, because it is unable to chew its food, what it does is it will typically bring its uh, prey or the or uh, the dead animal that is here, and it will bring this prey inside these roots. And once this prey gets entangled with the roots, then it will try to tear it apart. So these roots also support the crocodiles in a in this particular manner. Or the the crocodile once it has killed an animal, it will just bring the carcass and it will uh, put it here so that this carcass starts rotting. Once it starts rotting, it becomes easier for it to tear the flesh apart. So again, you have these mangroves here because you have this particular abiotic conditions of ample amount of sunlight, ample amount of water, high salinity and conditions of partial inundation. Now once you have the mangroves, they will support other species because of the community interaction, they will support a number of fish species, a number of crocodiles uh, and some crocodiles. Now if you have a heavy amount of fishes or a, or a large population of fishes in this area that would also support a number of birds in this area, a number of fish eating birds or the piscivorous birds. And once you have the piscivorous birds, then you will also have a large amount of dropping that will happen near these mangroves which will then further substantiate the growth of these mangrove trees. So there is a complete ecosystem that you will find in these areas. Now in biogeography when we are asking the question where are certain species found or what are the species that are found in certain area and why are they found in those areas. The first question that you need to ask is what are the conditions that are available in this area. So you will you'll have to talk about the abiotic factors that are available, the amount of sunlight that is there, the amount of moisture that is available, the level of fertility of the soils, the depth of soils or say the wind speed and so on. And with these abiotic factors, the next thing you will ask is what are the biotic factors that are available in this area? What are the other species that are found in this area? Do you have a number of uh, prey species that are available in this area because of these abiotic factors? Now, if you have uh, suitable prey species in this area, so you will also find so, uh, a number of predator species in this in these areas. So, when we are asking this question, why are these species found here? So, these are the connections that we need to make. Now, here we are observing that we are talking about uh, the altitudinal variation, so altitudinal zonation of forests in Sumatra. Now, if you talk about an area say an area that is at 10 degrees latitude, now if you move upwards, so typically the temperature reduces. So, you will start seeing a tropical forest, then you will move to a subtropical forest, then you will move to a warm temperate forest and maybe later on you will even move to the alpine forest. Now, in this case when we are talking about an altitudinal zonation, it is the temperature differences that are making all these different forests possible in any particular area. So, for instance you will find a warm temperate forest typically between 30 degrees and 35 degrees north of latitude. And you will find a subtropical forest typically between say 28 and 32 degrees. But then even if you are here between 0 and 10 degrees, you can find these forests if you can make these conditions available to the species. So, what we are saying here is that if you have this, uh, if you have a tall mountain, so in this portion you will typically find equatorial forests. and the location of this mountain is say close to the equator. Now, close to the equator you should find the equatorial forest, but then if because this area is tall, so you also get a zone where you have a lower temperature that is available. So, along with the equatorial forest or along with the tropical forest, you will also start seeing subtropical forests. Now, subtropical forests typically should not be found near equator, but then because you have made these conditions available, so you will find these species that are found in these areas as well. And then the species that are found in these subtropical forests will either be very same or related to the species that are found in the actual subtropical forests which are near the tropics. Then if you move further up, you will find the next zonation. 
So, uh, for instance, you can start seeing deciduous forest. Now, from the deciduous forest, you will have another zonation where you will start seeing the alpine forest and then even above you will start seeing the next kind of vegetation say you will start seeing the alpine grasslands and then on the very top because this area is now very cold so you will have a situation where it does not support any species so even in any particular location if you can make the other conditions available for certain species so those species will start thriving in those areas they will typically migrate to those areas and will start thriving now we'll look at migration in more detail later on and we cannot ask uh, questions just on these uh, uh, tree species but also on the uh, on different animal species that can be found in these areas so for instance if you look at the the distribution of anim of an animal such as the snow leopard now snow leopard is found in these areas now again you can ask this question why is snow leopard find, found in these areas what are the abiotic characteristics of the environment that are supporting the snow leopard in these areas and what are the uh, abiotic conditions and the biotic conditions that are not supporting snow leopard in other areas so here again you are asking two questions when if this is the distribution of snow leopard why is snow leopard found here that is the first question and the second question is why is, is the snow leopard not found here and once you have both these answers then you can understand the distribution of any particular species or if we talk about say the coral reefs now we have the coral reefs in these areas and here we have the minimum and the maximum temperatures of the seas now here you can see that the maximum temperature in these areas is following following this particular isotherm so maybe the question why the uh, corals are found in this area has a lot to do with the maximum sea temperature that can be tolerated by this particular species or it can be related to the minimum sea temperature that can be tolerated by this species why is this species not found to the very north or to the very south so for any particular species we can start by asking the questions what are the abiotic conditions that are found in this area what are the uh, specific adaptations that you have in this area and what are the other uh, biotic organisms that are found in this area that, that might support or that might not support the presence or absence of a species in any particular area. So, a study of all of these the distribution of animals or uh, the, the distribution of organisms and the reasons why a certain organism is found in an area and is not found in an area is what constitutes biogeography and we will look at it in more detail in the subsequent lectures. So, that is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.